Nyali Panjalang ni Rako Jugun Nyali Gani Garama Mala Jugun Wana Jangma Malaganu Mala Jugun Nyali Wana Janga Mala Jugun Nyaling Nyani Mala Jugun we are Rapal people from Bundjalung country. We look after this country. Don't do wrong round here, this country. We don't harm this country here. We belong to it. Nali Bundjalung Yi. Good evening. That was the voice of Delta K. Uh, elder of the Arakwal people, of the Banjalung Nation. It's in absolutely fundamental that we begin tonight by acknowledging it, Delta and the elders of the Arakwal people, past and future. I spoke with Delta about this event because it was a big thing for us to do, to move something from the book room um, over there and to come here. And I sought her, her guidance on how we might do it. She's away up in the north and was away for a few months and she expressed a great desire that tonight be filled with respect. Respect for all views, not just one view, that while we may agree on the view in majority or not, that we hold respect for all views. It fits kind of well for a bookshop particularly a bookshop in Byron Bay, where we are a community of very diverse people and very diverse ideas. And we try and serve that community by a bookshop of diverse titles. Um, my primary job this evening is to introduce the woman sitting with Thomas and Kerry. Julianne Schultz. <laughs> For those of you that don't know Julianne Schultz, researcher, journalist, academic, publisher, and for fun, she writes libretto for <laughs> operas. One of which won a prize. <laughs> Two of which. Two of which won a prize. <laughs> won two prizes. <laughs> um, if you don't know that about her, you should know about her book, The Idea of Australia. In my mind, it will surely replace Robert Hughes's The Fatal Shore as the go-to book on Australian history, on Australian society. And if you haven't, you're missing something. Um, Despite Julianne's great success, the book, the amazing things that she can do, the fact that she has an order of Australia, um, she's becoming most famous <laughs> in the recent time as the mother of Isabel Ronnie, who is the founder of Grata. Grata Fund is this organisation. For those of you that read the papers, you will have seen the... Um, um, the case that's been brought against the federal government by the people of the Torres Strait Islanders, be, uh, Islands, uh, because they have failed in their duty of care. They have not done the appropriate thing to stop climate change in that area, and it is drowning. I'll left some material out there, but please welcome Julianne Schultz. <laughs>
Thank, thank you very much, John. And indeed, um, we've just come back from doing grandparent duty looking after Isabel's daughter while she's been on the Torres Strait with this big case. So I feel very, very, we just got back like a couple of hours ago, so I sort of feel like I'm still partly in, the, in far north Queensland rather than this beautiful part of the world. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the remarkable people of the Bunchalung Nation and their elders past and present and, and, and future. Let's hope that this continues to flourish for very many, many, many years. I w it's my pleasure to introduce Kerry O'Brien and Thomas Mayo. Um, I don't know, do I really need to introduce you, Kerry, to this audience? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you all know Kerry. <laughs> um, what's, I mean, Kerry's had such a wonderful and distinguished and important career and he's been such an extraordinary contributor in this region uh, now for you know, almost a couple of decades or 10 years. 15 years? 12. 12 years, feels longer. Um, for a long time, he's made such a major contribution, um, both through his professional work and his really very intense involvement with the community. Um, and so this process that Kerry is now involved with in this book, The Voice to Parliament Handbook, all the detail you need to know about the voice and the recognition uh, referendum, which is upcoming, is actually a really crucial sort of departure in in some ways from Kerry's somewhat detached professional um, journalistic sort of um, involvement uh, <laughs> in the world um, because very clearly um, he's taken a very strong position um, which has informed the writing of this book with Thomas um, and it will be for sale, they will be signing it, you really need to buy a copy for yourself and for your friends and for anyone else who's got questions or wants to know more. It's sort of fitting, I think, that we should be doing this event here because the relationship between Thomas and Kerry really started as a result of another of, of John's um, bookroom events with your, was your third book, was it? That was the it was my, oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my first book. The first book. Yeah. But then I think maybe there was a, a subsequent books because you've been writing in this space as well as children's books and so on now for for quite some some time. Yeah, um, five books now. Five books, yeah, that's impressive. I think he beats both of us, Kerry. <laughs> um, and, and the process of including Kerry in the writing of this handbook, which sort of came out as a decision sort of after one of those events that you'd done here, um, I think really has added another really remarkably strong dimension to this handbook. You know, to tap into Kerry's extraordinary expertise and your your knowledge and um, involvement in the campaign um, has given that this handbook. There is a reason that the publishers have so, so far, I think, printed seventy thousand copies. Um, this is going to be a defining a defining text for this next little while in Australia. Um, and I should note that you you guys are generously donating a large portion of the royalties to. The Aboriginal, and, uh, the Indigenous Education, uh, the Indigenous Ad Literacy Foundation, the Literary F Sound Foundation, um, so that there's a, a, an ongoing benefit from this as well. So the road to this referendum has been a long one. Um, the failure to recognise and to come to any sort of meaningful agreement with the people who've been in this of this land forever is, in my view, the foundational unresolved of the unresolved issue of the nation we call Australia. It has been, been in what, in my view, again, has made Australia a half-formed thing. Until this is resolved, we will be forever cursed to uh, cosplay colonial politics in a battle between fear and courage. For those who developed the referendum question that is now before us, this history weighs heavily. It's close and personal. It's the root cause of the vast and many inequities that we fail to describe in technicolour because they're too confronting, preferring to use the grey bureaucratic language of we need to close the gap. Over the centuries, there have been many petitions and pleas, strikes and occupations, organised activities and attempts to work within the system by Indigenous leaders and communities. They've achieved considerable things over that time, but not this fundamental recognition that is missing from the Constitution and a means by which their voices can be heard. But for those who gathered in, at Uluru in 2017, enough was enough. What we saw from afar was the greatest example of deliberative democracy that this country has ever seen, and one of the really great global examples. 
They invited us, the other 96%, to walk with them and develop a truer definition of what fairness in this nation might mean. Thomas, I want to start by asking you about your journey both to get to Uluru and then subsequently. Um. Yeah, well, um, I was a wharfie from when I was 17 years old and uh, became a delegate soon after the 1998 Patrick's dispute uh, and then an official of the Maritime Union in 2010. So I got a good, of under good understanding of um, the value of unity, um, that it's more than just a word at a rally, you know, it's a, more than a catch cry, it requires structure and the ability to choose representation to come together regularly and reach consensus and um, then go out there with genuine unity, with some discipline um, to achieve what you know, your members want to achieve. Um, and, uh, and so that gave me a great understanding of that. And when uh, I became an official, I started to get more involved in organising uh, our own, around our own matters. So um, when Tony Abbott cut hundreds of millions of dollars from community services in 2015 uh, was one example. And if you look at the, you know, the issues in communities now, you, you know, these decisions, these harmful decisions, they have ripple on effects, you know. Um, but just organising around those things, helping to, you know, gather numbers to march on the street, to uh, call for inquiries and royal commissions, mm -hmm. like when the Don Dale, the, the awful treatment of children in Don Dale was exposed in, on Four Corners. Um, but as you see, when I was organising, uh, you know, our community's struggle, uh, it became apparent that we just weren't cutting through. Mm. Um, decision makers that were negligent or, you know, just playing politics with our lives and, and therefore, you know, very harmful. Um, there were no repercussions, there was no, um, and, and inquiries could come about or, you know, at best the Royal Commissions and then the recommendations were coming out and then nothing was getting implemented. Um, just starting to notice this constant failure and um, I became involved when I went uh, to the 2016, uh, it was a trial dialogue that the Referendum Council was running. Um, and they tested it out over two days. They worked out they needed three days for these dialogues because there was a lot of truth-telling on the first day, a lot of airing of grievances. Um, so these three-day dialogues then happened late 2016 and into 2017. And, uh, and they really um, brought together the priorities. You see, this, this process that I'm talking about, it led to the making of the Uluru Statement at Uluru when representatives were chosen. Those representatives, the job was to take the records of meetings to the heart of the nation and have one final three-day meeting. And our hope was that we could reach a consensus on, um, on what we would propose mm. from that point about the next steps for, um, for recognition. Um, and that was a unique opportunity. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was such a wonderful moment after three days of passionate debate and discussion. You know, I mean, you can imagine coming from all different parts of the country, uh, many different experiences and perspectives, um, you know, all of the broken promises that we've experienced, the many consultations with, you know, a lot of us had been in that had very little result, um, and trying to come up with this hopeful proposal. Um, an opportunity to reach a consensus that was that was a unique opportunity. Mm, mm. Uh, and on the final morning at Uluru, we endorsed the Uluru statement from the heart with standing acclamation and, and, and a lot of tears and joy of uh, tears of joy and hope. Um, I one of the, the, the I mean, that's how I came to be involved by being a part of all of that and. After so experiencing you, you that, became a, you were a member of one of the, the was that the Darwin one of the Darwin dialogues or the yeah, yeah, I was part of the Darwin dialogue, uh, elected um, to go to Uluru, yeah. and um, you know after being through all of that, and that, I mean an informed set of proposals came out of that, understanding the history of our struggle, understanding you know uh, the need for a voice because of all the awful things that happen when you don't have a voice exploited, ignored, mm. all the rest. One of the things that I think is important to 
um, for people to understand, is that the dialogues were highly structured, you know, that it wasn't a sort of random, oh, well, this, this group and this group, you know, these people will come together and we'll just sit around and have a yarn. I mean, there was obviously an element of yarning that went on, but, but it was highly structured in terms of the sort of civics education, the process, you know, the information on which people were making decisions. It was both their lived experience, but also a sort of crash course in the Constitution, which probably the whole nation could do with at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, there's a very low understanding of civics in this country, unfortunately, and it's, some, it's one of the challenges that we have. But, you know, like, the, there was a formula applied, and it was 60% traditional owners, um, and it was a formula to, to 100 participants, not to exclude anyone, but to try and ensure there was a cross-section of these experiences and perspectives and types of advocates. So it wasn't just the loudest of our people, but also the healers. You know, the, the different types of advocates could have a safe space to, uh, to have the debate and discussion that we did. Mm. Yeah. And so a gender balance. Gender balance, gender balance, stolen and, generations. And, and a guaranteed voice from young people as well. Yeah. yeah. I was part of organising the Darwin Dialogue. I was one of... So in each, each of the dialogues, there was two co-chairs, a male and female, and five local facilitators. They're all local. And it was, it was hard work mm. to try to apply that formula. You know, it wasn't perfect. No process is perfect. Uh, and whenever anyone has any criticism for the process that led to the making of the Uluru Statement, I accept that, right? But from uh, the perspective of an, activ a an activist, you know, um, someone not on the referendum council, you know, witnessing all of that and being a part of it, it was a great process. Mm. It was, it was actually, you know, I, I think proportionately the most representative constitutional dialogues this country has ever had. Well, it would, it would have to be. <laughs> um, it's interesting because in terms of the sort of whole, you know, one of the ways that many countries are embracing and dealing with complex issues is through this process of citizens, juries, deliberative democracies, and these sorts of models of how things can get done um, are very different to an old, you know, I vote one way, you vote another way um, approach to politics. And the, the model that was used here is actually world's best practice in terms of trying to ensure that different voices get heard and make an informed decision. Um, yeah, we should acknowledge Arnie Pat Anderson was a co-chair of the Referendum Council that led that process mm. and Professor Megan Davis, mm. um, a public law expert. Uh, you know, she was the first Aboriginal person elected to a permanent forum at the United Nations, does this sort of work worldwide, you know, mm. and um, I think her expertise shone through. So when you hear people saying, oh, it was just a, you know, how can we know that this is an authentic process? I mean it must make your, make your skin crawl. Oh, look, the, the thing here is, uh, and that, this, this, that contemporary history of the Uluru Statement is important, but as you said, you know, there was, a, there was, I don't know if you said this, but Rachel Perkins did this film that took us through the history of the struggle as well, because it was important for us to understand the lessons from the past. So not only were there elders in the room that could share their experiences and their heartbreak and all the different things that had happened, but also this film that took us right back you know, all of these other statements and petitions that had been written to kings and queens, you know, to, par to federal parliaments, always calling for a voice, always dismissed and ignored, except for the Barunga statement, which is a bit different, and we'll probably mm. talk about ATSIC. Mm. But, um, you know, that's a, a voice was established and then a voice was destroyed. Mm. Those lessons come together mm. at Uluru and uh, a part of what the Uluru statement is. And the point that I want to make here is... This is not Albo's idea. This isn't a politician's idea. It's not a Canberra voice. This came from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in that unique opportunity. Mm. To put our, yeah, that's, that's where it come from. Before, before I bring Kerry in, I just want to, want to pick up on one little thing that you were saying right at the beginning, because I think it's sort of important. Um, and that is about your union background. I mean, when you look back, when one looks back at the history of attempts to be heard, to be taken seriously, to be engaged with, you know, all of that whole history of struggle. It's so striking how many really big strikes there have been. You know, the big strikes in the Torres Strait, big strikes in the Pilbara, big strikes in Palm Island. You know, the, the, the union movement um, as a sort of organising tool, but as a sort of... As, a, um, as, as the, the place where people would be making their claim for, to be treated properly is... You know, it's 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 absolutely there and embedded. I mentioned that I was in Cairns, and in the Cairns Museum, there's this most 
beautiful photograph of the May Day March in 1962. And there's Joe McGuinness and a whole bunch of people immaculately dressed, saying, we want to be paid equally. Um, what happened to the UN declaration? We want our rights recognised. Very polite, sedate photograph of this, of this protest. But it's sort of an interesting thing that gets lost sight of how that activism has helped to inform this process over a long period. Yeah, I work with a fellow named, named Brian Manning. He was in his 70s. He, he was close to retirement. But he was one of them Morphies that had regularly taken supplies down to Gurindji country during the Wave Hill walk-off. Mm. Um, the Morphies being the first to respond to um, the union. Um, you know, went down to, um, to the Gurindji mob and supported them through that struggle. It's a, it's a long, proud history. I was very proud when I learned that history that the union had been such an important part of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander struggle for rights and mm. recognition. So, Kerry, what what do you what what's motivated you to take such, an, uh, you know, put so much of yourself on the line in a sense for this thing? What, what's at stake, and, and why is it so important? Julianne, compared to what other people have brought to this story that uh, Thomas has outlined uh, over the decades, compared to what tiny bit I'm doing, truly, I'm embarrassed to hear you say that uh, because. I'm serious. It's um, uh, the, the struggle. The struggle to come to this point has been massive, mm. absolutely massive, and it's been ongoing. And in truth, it goes back more than 200 years, and it's taken many forms. And 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 before I answer, um, when you're talking about equal pay, I still have burnt into my brain watching one of those "Who Do You Think You Are?" programs with Kathy Freeman, and Kathy being told, I think, for the first time from records as she was shown her own family history, the story of a grandfather uh, who lived on the outskirts of a town up in North Queensland and worked alongside white workers who were being paid far more than he was mm. for precisely the same work. Mm. And because he dared to ask for the equal right to be paid the same for the same work, he was sent to Palm Island. Mm. 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 And that is one tiny insight to the deep injustices that have scarred this country and this is a moment where we can do one small thing ourselves, one small but significant thing ourselves to make our own statement about that. Um, and, I mean, and I don't mean to suggest that, you know, your involvement, you know... No, 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 I, I, I wasn't chastising yeah, you, Julianne. No. I'm just a little bit embarrassed to be, to, for my efforts to be placed on no, the No, no, but I think it's important that's, that somebody of your stature has actually stepped up in this way. Um, well, I found it very easy when Thomas rang. I mean, I was on, on the edge of... Uh, this is a funny thing to say to you, but uh, <laughs> I was on the edge of making a decision about another project that I was becoming involved in. And, and uh, I was at the point of deciding that I couldn't continue with that project. Uh, and it was right at that moment that Thomas rang me and I said, I can't answer this now. If this other thing happens, I won't be able to do it, but I can come back to you next week. And I came back next week, having made the other decision. And, uh, and said yes. So in that moment, it was an easy decision for me to make, even though uh, I had never collaborated on a book before. I mean, my work in journalism is collaborative. It is very much in television. But it's a very different thing, as I've discovered, to write a book with another person, particularly by long distance, because this bloke has been crisscrossing the country so much, <laughs> um, it, it, his, his itinerary would look like Spaghetti Junction. <laughs> um, and we were never at any point in the same room, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and we, we worked out which chapters we'd do. But the thing that I felt that I could bring to the book was that I've reported on the history and I've been a witness to the history for more than 50 years, and I have seen things close up uh, that would bring you to tears. And if I think too much about them, they still bring me to tears. Mm. But... Um, the history is so vital to understanding this, so vital, because it is a story of betrayal, it is a story of white arrogance and, and white greed and white attempts at self-justification which come un become unravelled if you listen too much to the... If you, if you actually promote the real story too much. Our, uh, the way we like to see ourselves as a, a nation of equals, hmm? Uh, the way we like to see ourselves as, you know, fighting above our weight in the world. All these little images and big images that we have of ourselves and the portraits we like to paint, many of which are built on sand. And this is the big one. This is the big one. So, 
So I've seen Marbo come and go, I've seen Wick come and go, I've seen land rights, I've seen... Um, the, I, I sat in the committee room of Old Parliament House when Bob Hawke came down in 1987 and I thought rather reluctantly announced the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody, which, took, which was too long coming. But even when it happened, over the three or four years it took to gather all that evidence and make those 300 plus recommendations, still so many of those recommendations, which, which would have been almost, you know, very substantially implemented by the states, you would find very few of those recommendations that were universally recommended. Mm. And so there was another absolute glaring example where, where Indigenous voices were pleading to be heard, pleading to stop the deaths, the unjustified deaths, and in some cases, the criminal deaths, from continuing to occur. Uh, to occur. And where are we now? We're still seeing the deaths. We've got that Royal Commission, which has largely gathered dust. So that's one lesson. The real lesson, though, in terms of the voice, and, one of the, and, and I think one of the key driving reasons why Indigenous people uh, are so very clear-minded in the vast majority, are so very clear-minded of the need for a voice to be enshrined in the Constitution, to give it permanence. Because there have been many voices in the past. One government would come in, establish a voice. Gough was the first, really. Uh, Harold Holt's um, uh, first Indigenous voice to Parliament after the 1967 referendum, after his government was asked, well, now that you've got, the you've got this massive yes vote, what are you going to do with it? And his, uh, his minister, who probably hadn't realised he was Minister for Indigenous Affairs, he was uh, Seb Barnes, I think his title was Minister for Territory, or Minister for Territories, and he was asked what they were going to do, and he said, I don't know. But Harold Holt was moved to do something, so he appointed three people as the first advisory group on behalf of Indigenous people as a voice to his government, and they were three white men. And one of them was a former... Reserve Bank Governor, uh, another was a trained diplomat. The third was an anthropologist who had actually met Indigenous people and seen their communities and knew the some of the history, so that was something. Three white voices. Gough established the first one in 1973 uh, that actually was made up of Indigenous people who were elected from their communities. There were 41 of them. Gee, that was massive. You know, that had a huge bureaucracy behind it. Gee, they splashed out massive amounts of money. They were barely heard despite the great intent and the principle behind it, it was the first time that white bureaucrats and white politicians were actually confronted with a formal group of indigenous people who, 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 who God help us, they were given opinions. They were allowed to express opinions. So that, wasn't, that didn't go down too well. So that didn't really uh, have a chance to grow and develop for both sides to actually work out where they needed to come together and for the whites to actually let the penny drop that there were big things to listen to and that we could all learn from. So Malcolm comes in, you know, Goff's dismissed, Malcolm Fraser comes in, he, he knocks the numbers down from 41 to 35 and he changes the voting process and how much he listened to them, of course, you know, the only good thing I can, can remember from the, from the Fraser years about Indigenous, their Indigenous policy was, um, was that at least he continued the land rights legislation that Gough had put into the parliament. Big tick for Malcolm Fraser there, he saw that through. But so then, then uh, Hawke comes in, Malcolm's uh, voice to parliament goes, and there's a long, a long wait, and then there's ATSIC in 89 after the Barunga Statement. ATSIC comes in, it, go, it lasts for about 13 years, but, but, but uh, so that comes in at about 1990, it starts. 1996, John Howard comes in, and it was on borrowed time. I mean, the statements that are on the record from John Howard in opposition made that very plain. He referred to it as a black parliament. He voted against it. They had all sorts of derogatory things to say about it at the time. Uh, he comes in, slices the budget to buggery, but it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. There's some governance issues here and there's a bit of criticism there, but there's a lot of good things done. A lot of young indigenous people being trained up who subsequently emerge as great leaders. A lot of good things happen from ATSIC. But John Howard eventually gets his wish. Mark Latham from Labor announces that, that the Labor opposition is also going to oppose ATSIC. So John Howard abolishes it. Done. And if you look at the checkerboard of various attempts at Indigenous voices from then to now, nothing has had great effect. Nothing has really lasted. 
Everything keeps changing. And if you then look back at the policies with the, who, who's, who have, that have cost billions of dollars to implement, but the policies that have failed and the gaps that have grown while those policies are being put into place, invariably those policies failed because Indigenous advice was neither sought nor heeded. One or the other, sometimes both. And last word, Marcia Langton, great Australian, great Australian. Marcia Langton, who's one of the co-authors uh, of the co-design approach on, a, on a, um, a voice that she and Tom Carmer and a number of others uh, recommended after the uh, Uluru process, Marcia Langton talked about the, about the many communities they then went round, 110 communities they consulted, and she said, and Karma said, that time and time and time again these communities talked about the, the fly-in, fly-out bureaucrats who would fly into town, take copious notes, get back on their planes, maybe they made promises, maybe they, they said they'd do this, that or the other, nothing was ever heard from them again, or if a policy eventually emerged from that process and when it failed, no sign that they'd actually heard anything that they'd, that they'd been making the notes about. So, so that history is fundamental to our understanding of why it is important to have this voice enshrined in the Constitution, a small voice to Parliament, according to the, the recommendations so far, but a voice that will be selected by Indigenous communities representing the grassroots of communities around Australia. Mm. It, it, as you go through that list, I mean, you imagine, Thomas, that if there had been a voice um, when ATSIC was being abolished, when the intervention was being announced, when the Racial Discrimination Act was being suspended, when Abbott withdrew the billions of dollars from the programs that he withdrew them from. What, what, because people are very exercised about what practically it might mean, I mean, it, it's, it's speculative because we're talking about something which has happened in the past, but how would you imagine that a voice would have responded to those, you know, those examples which Kerry's has just provided. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what was missing. That's what I learnt just from observation initially, and then, um, you know, coming together with other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders and, and advocates, that we just didn't have that structure. Um, I mean, ATSIC had some; it was doing some wonderful things, but how it amplified its problems and didn't celebrate its wins. It, it was, it was all about softening up the Australian public to to do what he eventually did. Um, he didn't want us to have a voice. Mm. Uh, the Kirribilli statement was in 2015 and it was a response to this, right? So the uh, ATSIC was abolished, what was it, 2006? 2004. 2004. 2004, five. And five, yeah. So ATSIC was abolished and then what did we see when, you, when you're voiceless? Because when you're voiceless, you're exploited, you're degraded, you're ignored, you're too easily divided. You know, there's no structure with which you can come together and defend yourselves. After he destroyed ATSIC, then we had the Northern Territory intervention, which, was, which required the Racial Discrimination Act to be suspended. That's how racist it was. And the Australian Army mobilised into the most vulnerable communities in the Northern Territory that we know cost, you know, a massive amount of taxpayer dollars for, and, and made things worse. You know, the Northern Territory intervention, what I mentioned with Abbott, cutting hundreds of millions of dollars from community services. We saw money meant for Indigenous benefit, you know, so Indigenous royalty money in, in the Northern Territory given to non-Indigenous organisations that use those funds, not for the advancement of Indigenous people at all, but to fight against land rights, you know, to fight against native title claims and all this, you know, money meant for our benefit, indigenous money from things, you know, being exploited on their country. Uh, these are the things that happen when you don't have a voice. And so the Kirribilli statement was 39 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders called for a meeting in this crisis because the gap was widening. And, uh, and it said two things that are important to this. It said, firstly, that when it comes to constitutional recognition, we need more than symbolism. We need a substantive form of, re of recognition that gives our people greater fairness. Fairness was the, the word used. Um, and that secondly, we want a referendum council established to go and take this question to our people, um, not just Aboriginal communities and Torres Strait Islander communities, but broader Australia. And mm. that was an important part of the development of this. You know, when you talk about the intervention, so 2007, it was becoming pretty obvious 
uh, to everyone, including John Howard, that, uh, that he was on shifting sands as far as his chances of winning his, the election later that year. So the intervention takes place around mid-year uh, to massive media coverage. And in November, immediately after the election result where, um, where the Howard government lost and John Howard lost his seat, one of his very senior ministers, Alexander Downer, went on Insiders, and it, it, uh, I've, I've seen transcript, I can't remember. It, it may well have been one of those uh, post-election analysis programs, I'm not sure. But Alexander Downer actually uh, said uh, how disappointed they were when the bounce that they expected from the intervention in the opinion polls didn't happen. There in the transcript from the insiders, Alexander Downer, one of John Howard's closest and most loyal confidants. And you will remember that Amanda Vanstone, who was Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, I think at the time or just before, talked about communities as theme parks or as she had this, this thing, what is the point of maintaining these communities that are just sort of rural, you know, strange sort of isolated groups in the in the middle of nowhere as though it was some sort of throwback to another age. I mean the the level of the level of disrespect mm. and ignorance was just profound. I mean mm. how on the night before the election, on the last night of the election, I mean he must have known he was he was going to lose to Rudd in two thousand and seven. He had an event at the um, at the Wentworth Hotel, I think it was still called the Wentworth, you know, the, mm. in, in central Sydney where he announced that there would be a referendum on recognition. I mean, his, his failed attempt in the, in the 1999 referendum mm. had gone down. And it was, I mean, I, I was there and I thought, this is, this is a man clutching at straws. Yeah, I mean, this is the reason why we have to have the courage to do this referendum. I mean, people might have wondered, why are Indigenous people putting themselves through this? It's because we, we need a voice, we know that. Without a voice, you know, you go backwards, but we need to do it differently. We need to protect it from people like Howard. I mean, can you imagine, with all the things that Peter Dutton has said about this so far, can you imagine if, if we only legislated this representative body, what he would do as soon as he wins power, if he, if he wins power? Like, he'd get rid of it with a stroke of a pen. He'd, he'd jump at the chance. What, one of the things in, in the book, Thomas, you, in, your, in your opening chapter, which is a very, very lovely description of being on the road with the Uluru Statement and going you know, all over the place, you know, t you know, telling the story and engaging people very directly. It's a really lovely, lovely piece of writing. Um, one of the um, things in, phrases in there you say was the suspension of the disbelief that this could become real. And I'm just wondering, I mean, that's obviously, you must have finished this December, January, before, before Dutton started the, what is this all about? Here are the 13 questions and all the sort of subtle under... 15. 15 questions. 15 questions. 15, yeah. questions. 15, 15 yeah, vital and questions. The, un the undermining of, 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 the, of the integrity of the process. I'm just wondering whether that sort of suspension of disbelief that it might become real, how, how, you, how that's been challenged for you as the campaign has got uglier in the last little while. I mean, yeah, we, we, we wanted bipartisan support, of course, and, geez, I, I, I want people to be, be conscious of how hard we worked to try and bring them on board, you know, because you can't ignore that only 8 out of 44 referenda questions have passed um, and that they've only passed so far without, with, with bipartisan support. And we, we worked hard to bring them on board. I mean, there was the work that Pearson and, and others had done, you know, to, to explore this, Unipingu, the late Unipingu, to explore this before um, the process even began, to see if, you know, if this is something that could um, be supported by Conservatives. There was the work, you know, after it, um, even after Turnbull's dismissal, you know, just constantly meetings with, you know, people from that side of politics to try and bring them on board. Um, and, I, you know, meeting Dutton uh, during the negotiation for the actual words in, in um, earlier this year. Uh, but, you know, you could just feel it. There, there was never any genuine uh, listening from him then. Um, you know, your, your, say some things campaign. in there and then say something else when he walked out to the media. You know, there's 15 questions thing. Your, your campaign group actually went to a lot of trouble in giving him a very extensive briefing, right? Yeah, yeah, we gave him uh, campaign, at least a couple. Your, your, yeah. your, your advisory group, 20. The, the, so I'm, I'm a member of the referendum working group, uh, 20 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people like Marcia Langton, 
Tom Kalmer, Peter Yu, you know, so much collective experience and, and work in this space by a lot of them. And uh, yeah, we, we met with Peter Dutton and um, Julian Lisa um, twice as the referendum working group. Um, the discussion inside the, the room was, was fine, but different things would be said as soon as he was in front of the media trying to undermine it. And it was just so disappointing. Um, we've worked hard f for that. And you know what, it, it does put a fire in my belly though, you know, that we can make history here and be the first referendum that wins without bipartisan support, you know, and <laughs> wouldn't that be good? And, and it does help that structurally the attachment to party, you know, the two-party system has broken down. You know, it's still, it's not anywhere near as, as controlling as, as it once was. Kerry, can I just bring you in here a little? I mean, Thomas talked a bit about the speaking with different tongues to the media and what's said in closed doors. I mean, what's been your assessment of the way that the media has responded to this? I mean, what's the sort of level of maturity um, and insight that's look, I, been brought to it? I, I think it's probably a little bit better now, but, um, but I've been seriously unimpressed and disappointed with my erstwhile colleagues, um, and I don't like throwing stones at my own mob. Um, perhaps one proprietor aside. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think that the reporting for a long time was pretty shallow. Some, some, th there have been some notable exception, s exceptions, and I think some journalists are now digging deeper. But, uh, but I think that, that uh, you know, the analysis of things like Peter Dutton's 15 questions and what real value and what real intellect and what real integrity drove those questions, I didn't see much of that analysis in the mainstream media. Um, some of the more specious claims have been reported as claims coming from the No campaign, again, with marginal, t you know, marginal analysis on it. Uh, for some journalists, it's as if it's been enough simply to um, supply the quotes alongside a No campaigner um, and just leave them sit there with very little, uh, you know, I think, God help us, if it isn't fundamental to a journalist's role uh, to separate the truth from the rest, mm. whether it's whether it's you know no, no matter who is being quoted, no matter who is saying it, it is a fundamental part of our job as journalists to analyse that and separate the wheat from the chaff, and and I think there's been a lot where it hasn't, mm. and so I think rather and and yet these same journalists are reporting the confusion. Mm. That one of the things that they are con it's like a constant refrain that there's this great mass of Australians out there who don't really understand it. Well, whose bloody job is it, <laughs> if not ours as journalists? One of the um, things that I notice when I talk to some of my Aboriginal friends is they say, your ability to vote yes in this depends on your trust in the Australian system and in the Australian, and in the Australian people. And a couple, one person in particular said to me, in the end, she said, I'm going to vote yes because I saw what happened with the referendum question and that that closed down discussion of a referendum for, to an, you know, it's still, it's not on, you know, in terms of a, a republic referendum, sorry. Um, and, but still there is this question, this question of can you really trust the Australian people? Can you trust the Australian system to deliver? And I think in, for some people it leads to a sort of rather nihilistic sort of response. You know, the, you look at the history, it is, you know, by and large not good with occasional peaks of, of achievement. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in what, what you say when people say that to you, Thomas. I mean... Yeah, look, firstly, I understand that you... Um, this, there's a really low level of trust um, for a lot of our people, for the system and for government and processes as I said, consulted and nothing comes out of it um, often. Uh, and so, you know, that's understandable. Um, you know, we're not all going to support this, you know. I'm sure, you know, I'm absolutely certain that um, we've got a majority of Indigenous people that support this. So, you know, there's constant, there's polls that show over 80% support um, and the process that led to the making of the Uluru Statement itself. Um, it's 
you, you mentioned, you know, having to suspend our disbelief um, to do this, and, and that is what we've done. Mm. Um, we need to do it because you can't just legislate a voice. We know that that will set us up to fail. And we're putting our faith in the Australian people to walk with us, you know, to... Um, we really are, you know. I believe that Australians are fair-minded. I, I don't... I don't think... As, I don't think that this will lose from a position of a, of a majority of Australians not believing that we should be recognised and that something should be done. The only thing that can lose this for us is confusion and fear, mm. which is the tactic of the No campaign. Mm. Yeah. One of the... Because um, we want to have some time for questions and we need to leave time for Thomas to recite the Uluru Statement as well. But there was one thing which I just wanted to raise with you before we go to, to questions, and that was that it seems to me that it's very easy to forget how this looks from outside. I mean, we're all very much focused on how this plays internally in Australia. Um, but I think that for the rest of the world, what this is, is a way of either confirming the, their worst thoughts about this country or affirming their best prospects of what the country might be. Um, and I say that because, you know, Australia has... Uh, you know, as a well-founded basis for being a racist nation. I mean, it's there in the Constitution. Section 51 is a, is, is a part of the Constitution which enables the state to introduce legislation which is explicitly racist. Mm. Um, so I, my question is, how does this look from outside? I mean, my sense is that, in a way, it's our Brexit, that the rest of the world will look at it and think, well, surely this country will recognise its first peoples. Every other settler society has done that. Um, but maybe it'll be like Brexit and produce a result which is sort of incomprehensible um, to much of the world. Um. Kerry? Yes, Tom. Well, firstly, for those that... <laughs> I just want to make sure that people are aware. Section 5126, you know, this low level of civics, are just so... In our constitution is section 5126, which gives the federal parliament... Uh, the power to make special laws about a race of people. Um, it was changed in 1967. It, was, it excluded Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people initially. Um, and so it was changed in 67 to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in that power. And our elders saw that as important, an incremental step that we needed to take because the states were so cruel and negligent to Indigenous people. And the federal parliament was seen as a better place for that power to rest. Um, Can I just say, the, the obvious things that were done with that are the White Australia policy, the mm. deportation of Pacific Islanders, and the banning of speaking Japanese on the telephone in the 1920s. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> but since, since 67, it was only used to make special laws about Indigenous people, and the Hindmarsh case was in the 90s. Uh, it, it determined that it could be used not necessarily for Indigenous people's benefit, but to discriminate to our detriment. Um, and so the voice is seen as a way to be able to monitor the race power, to ensure that it is used for our benefit, you know, with some political and moral authority. But Julianne, to, to come to your question, the, the, you know, Australian leader after Australian leader has travelled the world, but particularly this region, lecturing our neighbours and other countries about their human rights abuses. And, uh, and it has gone on and on and on and on. Uh, and, and we have built this modern country on a constitution, a national rule book, which is not sacred, which has its deep flaws, which is very hard to change, but nonetheless can be changed. But if we wake up on the morning after the referendum and we have voted yes nationally and yes in at least four states and we have a new section in the constitution, uh, then not just our leaders but all of us can stand a little taller, not just in our own communities and in our own nation, but when we look to the world. And, uh, and we can feel just that little bit less embarrassed, and I'm speaking now more for those... I mean, the number of times I have watched these dialogues take place, and I've watched the Australian leaders come out and do their press conferences afterwards, uh, where, they've, where they trot out, where they've, uh, they've spoken to Indonesia about East Timor, or they've... Uh, spoken about human rights abuses in China or various other countries around the around the region, and and uh, you feel embarrassed. And here is an opportunity 
and a moment that we can look forward to, I hope, where that can change, at least to this degree, that we have taken a big step to addressing one fundamental sin of modern Australia. Do you want to talk about what no might mean? I'm wondering whether it's worth... I don't want to bring the tone down from that because that's a really inspiring point, but I just wonder whether it's worth just for the audience speculating a little on what a no vote would mean. Um, ah, look, I think of it like this. I mean, just firstly, a last little bit on that. We're not even doing anything different in the world. We're catching up with like countries, you know. Minister Bernie said it during the election campaign that um, for like nations, we're the only one that doesn't have constitutional recognition of Indigenous peoples. I think most people have heard that we're the only ones without a treaty, but, and that, that was, you know, that checks out. Um, we're just catching up. Um, what was your question? My question was, uh, what, what Kerry ske sketched a picture of, of being able to walk a little ah, taller yeah, yeah. If, if we vote yes. Just to flip it, I'll what happens it, if we vote no? I'll put it this way. I want to see, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our community smiling and celebrating. You know, I want to see good, you know, fair-minded people celebrating on our TV screens. I don't want to see, you know, and it, and it really, you know, puts a... I don't want to see Pauline Hanson and Peter Dutton celebrating that they've knocked this off, you know? That's, that's what we're up against here, you know? I mean, who wants to see that? We've got to, get, we've got to get out there and do the hard work to win this. Because we're not going to win it unless we go out there and have conversations with people. We're not going to win it because, you know, the media is already against us. Um, social media is just a, just a cesspool of, um, you know, race and hate, racist stuff and hate and all the rest. Um, it's going to be won by Australians talking to Australians, systematically working through everybody that you can influence, you know, take them by the hand and bring them along to vote yes at the ballot box. Can we maybe go to some questions? Um, we, we started a little late, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep it going for a bit. Yeah. Is, it, is it possible to bring the light up just slightly on the audience so that we can actually see you? That's good. <laughs> Hi. There's somebody there with their hand up in a, about an impossible position to get a microphone to. <laughs> Wait a minute, no, no, come, we, we've got a mic. Uh, we've been talking about it. We've been talking about it internally. Uh, hold it up. We've been talking about it internally and we don't quite understand what's in it for Dutton. What, why is he doing this? What's his point? He's well, going to lose voters, surely, mm. on the edge. I, I personally think he will lose voters either way, whether there's a win or a loss in the referendum. I, I, and there's a, I mean, I've analysed it. I, I think that, uh, you see, Peter Dutton's big challenge after the last election where a very substantial uh, number of traditional Liberal voters turned their backs on the Liberal Party. And a very big part of his challenge is to try and work out a way to bring them back, even though uh, it was almost like he'd uh, written them off in his early uh, analysis of how the Liberal Party would find its way back into government. He said that they were going to focus much more on, uh, on the sort of western suburbs of the Sydneys and Melbournes and so on. He was going to focus on those outer urban sprawls. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I, I believe uh, with some background knowledge, because I travelled around a lot of those teal electorates in the last election, um, and and uh, one of the issues that was in discussion, it wasn't primary, because there were these key issues like climate change and you know having an integrity body in government on which on which Morrison was particularly vulnerable. Uh, but but in the mix was the need for reconciliation and the voice and the Uluru statement. It was there. He's not going to get those people back with the stance he's taken, uh, regardless of the outcome. I frankly think. Uh, and, uh, and if he loses, that's if he wins. If he loses, and, and so then he, he continues to be vulnerable, and he's, and, and, but if he, if he actually, if the referendum wins, that's a big loss to him anyway, politically. So what's in it for him? Uh, I think, one, uh, the, the importance that he places in shoring up his position inside the Liberal Party with his leadership, that he tries to maintain uh, enough support in the party to remain leader. Uh, and I think where he has not been landing blows uh, 
uh, up until the very recent past against the Albanese government that he sees this, if he can actually bring this referendum down, that that will be a blow to Albanese's credibility. And the starting point for a no campaign in any referendum is that it is much easier to try to tear this thing down than it is to build it up. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's, that's absolutely right. And, but but if, if no wins, he will have fatally wounded Albanese's prime ministership. No, I don't think so. Not fatally. No. No, I don't believe that. No. I don't no? believe that, okay. no. No, I think no he might hope be, that, but I don't uh, think his hope is going to be... <laughs> and, it, frankly. and especially as time goes on, I mean, people are going to be angry that he took that stance and he brought down this opportunity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, our children are going to be telling us, what have you done? Yeah. You know? A, a word about the teals. I, mean, I understand that the, the, the people who are in the, 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 those teal candidates, well, they're not candidates now, members of parliament, are, are running a competition between, between them to see who can get the most votes in each of Which is fantastic. Most years. We should all be doing that. They're I think Byron Bay is going to get the highest vote, eh? <laughs> yeah? Yes. Um, thanks, Julianne and Kerry, uh, for the conversation, and Thomas. Thomas, I, I, I'm really interested, if you wouldn't mind, to speak to the Sovereign No um, case. Mm. And certainly here... Uh, we are very aware that there's a very strong sovereign no position within Bundjalung community. And yep. uh, perhaps if do you perhaps explain yeah, <laughs> to yeah, talk to the sovereign yeah, no, but absolutely. also um, your view on that position, uh, yeah. which is a credible position. Yeah, so look, the it's important to think about, we're all having a vote on this, right? Yes or no? Okay, there's a proposition there. Do we want to recognise Indigenous people by establishing a voice so that we listen to? Uh, you've got to think about the arguments for or against from anyone, including the sovereign no. If it's a matter of having no trust at all for, you know, governments and systems and, you know, not wanting to be a part of the constitution, we can respect that, right, and understand it. Um, but do we have a choice on being in this system or not? I would say we don't. You know, our children are locked up under the system, through laws. People that uh, murder our people in prison, or you know, as we as we know what happened in Central Australia not that long ago. Um, what helps people get off from doing those terrible acts to our people? You know, the law. How do we improve the laws? How do we improve the policies? We need to have a voice to do that. Okay. Another argument is that this is going to cede our sovereignty, is one of the arguments that uh, are made. Um, but we should look to these things. Firstly, what experts have said, like Professor Megan Davis and Professor Hannah McLeod, Indigenous experts, uh, Tony McAvoy, you know, the first Indigenous silk, and, and other experts, you know, non-Indigenous experts, that you do not cede your sovereignty. This is not a question about our sovereignty. This is about establishing a voice. If anything, it strengthens our place in this country, on our country by having self-determination over who speaks for us. They also explain that you cannot cede your sovereignty through this because the only way that you can is by the First Nation, the people of a First Nation agreeing to, in a treaty, okay? So it's a matter of ceding your sovereignty in that way. So this is not a vote about Indigenous sovereignty at all, okay? Another way to look at it is that there are, as I mentioned earlier, we're the only like nation that doesn't have constitutional recognition of Indigenous peoples. You can look to those other nations and ask yourself, have those Indigenous peoples disappeared from the face of the earth? Are they suddenly assimilated from the point that they have constitutional recognition? No. You know, they, they continue to be, you know, the, who they are. Uh, finally, I'm not going to wake up the morning after uh, the referendum um, succeeding and no longer being Kurrareg, Kukugal, Arabumle, you know? I'm gonna to continue to be who I am, I'm gonna to continue to try and advance my community and, and help my people and practice my culture. So I hope that helps. On the treaty first argument, it's uh, illogical to, and I'll, I'll try and quickly, it's illogical because you need to set up a representative body in a federal system to have a conversation with the federal parliament about their obligations to treaty. It's also illogical because treaties are already underway. It's like saying we want something first, but actually it's already happening in states and the Northern Territory. The processes have begun. 
And finally, on that, treaties are going to take many decades, according to our experts, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, many decades. Because of the complexity of treaty over 200 years after first contact, it's not like other nations doing treaty at the beginning. Um, so if you look at Victoria, the most advanced process, 10 years in, um, not at the point of a log of claims, no one's fault, it's just the complexity of it. So why would we wait an unknown amount of time for an unknown outcome before we go and take care of the issues about housing and justice and infrastructure and services now? You know, we've got to do it now. There's another one over here, I think the person in the green shirt. Oh, sorry. The other issue about the sovereignty, and Robert French, uh, a former mm. Chief Justice of the High Court, spelled out in very clear terms, um, th there are these two sovereignties. It's a little bit like, in a way, that there are two common laws. There is the common law that came with British settlement in Australia, and that is, you know, really the fundamentals of our uh, democracy are built on the British model. Uh, including our court system, the rule of law, the separation of powers. Uh, and, and if you are going to have one sovereignty replacing the other sovereignty, and the primary, the, the, the national sovereignty of this country, Australia, is the sovereignty vested in the parliament and the democratic system. And if there was going to be a legal process where one sovereignty was going to replace another sovereignty, it simply can't happen because the High Court is a part of the of the other system. The High Court can't abolish itself, which is what it would be being asked to do if it was hearing a case of Indigenous sovereignty replacing that sovereignty of the Parliament, the sovereignty of the nation. They exist as two separate sovereignties. And French, in a very clear way, for a lawyer, um, <laughs> lays out how these two will continue to exist and how the establishment of the voice in the Constitution will have absolutely no bearing on Indigenous nations' sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the, the fact that the voice would be a voice to the Federal Parliament and a lot of the areas where the gap is the worst are state jurisdictional things like housing, health, education, etc. So uh, can you envisage that there will be state voices to state parliaments if we get through this first hurdle? Yeah, certainly. There's, there will be regional and local layers of representation, you know, like a lot of representative bodies, you know, you have layers of representation. Um, so, so local and regional. Uh, an example is South Australia have already legislated a voice that will feed into the national voice. Um, so that's, that's a very important question. Thank you. And are there, are there indi any indications that any other states are looking at doing the same? Uh, uh, Victoria. But, the vo yeah. a, but a voice... Queens vo Queensland uh, doesn't have a voice. Uh, what, it ha is what it is now advanced down the road, pathway to is treaty and, mm. and truth. And, and I was a part of uh, an advisory group advising that government on that pathway, and one of the first questions I asked inside that series of conversations was... What about a voice? And uh, I suspect, and uh, it's not based on anything anyone's told me, I suspect that, that, uh, that the Queensland Government was possibly a little bit leery that the politics of having a voice and the process of going through that discussion uh, might have been too much for Queenslanders. If that's the case, I find it very disappointing. On the other hand, uh, what I was ex incredibly impressed by is the uh, the extraordinary numbers of very impressive, articulate and bright Indigenous people who were, in fact, um, uh, a big part of running that department. Mm. Uh, the head of the Department of Indigenous Affairs is Indigenous. Uh, but in, Tas in, in Victoria, I think, there was a voice. Yeah, yeah. So it just goes to logic. I mean, yeah. you can't have a treaty negotiation unless you establish a voice, right? right? Um, so, yeah, Victoria has established the First Peoples Assembly. Yeah. Uh, and Queensland, I have no doubt, will, will establish something as well as has South Australia. Well, the, 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 the recommendations of the Karma Langton report, I think, are that there should be uh, a local 
equivalent of the voice and a regional voice as well as the national voice. I just want to make this point here that we're not voting on, on the model, okay? So we're no. talking model here. And this, is, this goes to the detail thing, the 15 questions, and Dutton knows very well. What we're voting on is if we're recog So the words are basic like this, so I'll paraphrase the 93 words that will go into the Constitution. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, one, there shall be a voice. Two, the voice can make representations to the Parliament and Executive Government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And three, the Parliament decides the rest, the model. Okay, so we're voting on recognition and listening to Indigenous people. That's what we're saying yes or no to. Thank you. Um, sorry, there's a person. I think in the second, is that someone in the second row? That yeah, yeah. No, sorry. Okay. Um, hi, Thomas. Um, you talked about the need to, you know, we've got to win a vote in a, in a few months. Um, the, some of the no campaigners have been trying to confuse the issue and particularly talking about executive, a voice to the executive government and, you know, asking a bunch of questions will it start moving defence bases and, and, and changing interest rates and so forth. Um, can you give us some ad advice on what to say to sort of combat that confusion that's been created? And the second question is, Indeed. what do you guys need from us as a community to, to win this vote? I'll let Kerry ask the answer. Well, I'll, I'll answer the first part, and Thomas, I'm sure, is very keen to answer the second. Um, I, I think uh, as good a way as any of answering this is to go to the comments of a man that Peter Dutton chose to be his spokesman on Indigenous relations when he became opposition leader. And that's a man named Julian Lisa. And Julian Lisa has spent an enormous time, he's probably put in more legwork than any other single member on the Conservative side of Parliament, certainly of this Parliament. Uh, and Julian Lisa, uh, on a point of principle, when Peter Dutton determined on behalf of his front bench that they would be locked into supporting the no vote, or, or that, that yes, that they would be that they would be joining him, Peter Dutton, in in um, uh, supporting the no campaign, and that backbenchers might be able to wander around and do what they like, but uh, but that's what the front bench would do. P uh, Julian Lisa resigned, set back his career in the process, and about three or four weeks, probably four weeks ago now, when they were having the debate in the Parliament uh, about the form of words and whether they are appropriate for the bill. A bill, mind you, that Peter Dutton, although he's opposed to the, to the actual referendum, uh, voted for the referendum. He actually supported the referendum bill going through the parliament and about a minute and a half after that was passed, he's calling on, a on Anthony Albanese not to do it. I mean, you know, work it out. Uh, but Julian Lisa said in his speech, handpicked by Peter Dutton to represent the Liberal Party on this very issue. He said, uh, the, the voice enshrined in the Constitution will close the gap. And he itemised the various measures where he felt that would be so. Based not on some kind of lofty hope, but based on years of his knowledge, his build-up of knowledge on all of these issues, he said that the gaps would be closed because Indigenous voices would be presented in the policy process and if they were listened to, you would see better outcomes out in Indigenous communities. He also said in answer to the claim that somehow or other Indigenous people were going to be promoted to some special place of privilege if the voice is enshrined in the Constitution, he said there will be no two Australias. There will not be two Australias as a result of this voice. On the contrary, there will be a fairer Australia. So that is Peter Dutton's hand-picked man. I can quote from uh, many of the eminent, and say in some cases preeminent, constitutional law experts, both in academia, at the bar, and in the High Court itself. Again, Robert French, former Chief Justice of the High Court and former President of the Native Title Tribunal, um, Kenneth Hayne, put into the High Court by Conservative government, taken by another Conservative government and asked if he would conduct the Royal Commission into banking, so trusted by the Conservative side of politics, Kenneth Hayne unequivocally says it is rubbish that there will somehow be a pro, uh, an outcome uh, if Indigenous people are allowed to, to, uh, to uh, make representations uh, to um, ministers or departmental heads or to the Cabinet, which together make up executive government. Uh, that, 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 un, uh, that the opposite of the claims, the
the claims are that somehow or other the wheels of government will come to a grinding halt because these indigenous people who have fought for 200 years to get this right enshrined in the constitution to have their voices heard are going to fritter it away on bullshit. <laughs> you know? They say rubbish to that, rubbish. And the second part, that it's going to bring the, uh, the, the, high, the whole court system to a grinding halt because of specious claims. It is a nonsense. It is built on nonsense. Thomas, on what can people do? Yeah, just a little bit out. Um, we insisted on the executive government being in there as leaders on the referendum working group. Um, and, and as has been debunked, as Kerry talked about, that's not going to cause the wheels of government to come to a halt. But we insisted on it because if we're only able to make representations to the parliament, then the decision has already been made by the time it reaches that point about the policy or the bill. Um, we need to be at the inception of the shaping of policies and laws, and that's how you get the best results. So we needed that guarantee. Um, how you can help? Well, look, there's, um, there's a supporters group here. I met a couple of people that are part of that. Yeah, put your hands up. No? Yeah, there. Yep. Okay, yeah. So every town and city that I've been going to lately, it's been great. There's supporter groups being set up. Um, there's, uh, you know, for the campaign. So join that supporters group. Um, register on Yes23, the website, yes23.com.au. There is a page on that website for connecting to local supporter groups or starting one if there's not one in your area. So um, please do that. There's also the Kitchen Tables Conversations. That's Yes20... Uh, TogetherYes.com.au. Um, that is a, a, a campaign to help people to have conversations in their homes with, um, you know, 10 family and friends type of thing. Um, and as I said earlier, that's how we're going to win, by getting out there and, and doing the work and speaking with people. And those things are already happening and the kitchen table conversations are, are fairly closely based uh, on the model that the Teals followed, which was pioneered by Cathy McGowan in the seat of Indi, mm. which had been... Uh, a, cons a safe conservative seat forever, uh, and uh, and and really, Cathy McGowan won that seat. Off, but the, of course there was discontent in the electorate. People felt that they were taken for granted, uh, but it was a whole series of kitchen table, com literally kitchen table conversations around that the reach, the whole reach of that electorate, and a lot of young people were caught up in it as well. A lot of young people, and there's the other part of the reason to hope that the foundation, a genuine foundation for hope in the way the millennials voted in the last election and women generally, women generally, this sense that so many people who had probably voted the same way all their lives suddenly felt there's got to be a better way to make my vote count. Mm. And they did. And it did. Just to add <coughs> visibility as well, yeah. okay? We've only got about 16 weeks until this just to bring about the urgency here. Uh, probably mid-October is when the referendum will be, so we need visibility. So, you know, shop fronts, shirts, um, get on Yes23, get your, your uh, merchandise and help us out with that too. And can I just add about the, um, the kitchen table conversations that the, uh, the, the Together Yes are running? Um, they've started rolling out around the country and the feedback that's coming through is extraordinary. People are finding them really empowering and sort of instructive as well. Um, so there'll be, I don't think the, the brochures were meant to be here today, but they'll be in the bookshop um, in, the, in the next week. So if people are looking to, to join those or initiate those conversations, I would strongly recommend them because it's, it's actually a very interesting activity. One of the, the feedbacks that came the other day, which I'll just share with you because it sort of tells the point nicely, was um, a builder in one of the groups in South Australia went to his work site the next day and he said, look, I've just realised just how enormous this indigenous history of this land is. And he pulled out his builder's tape, six metres. He said, that's how long indigenous people have been in this land. And then he pulled out another 20 centimetres and said, and that's how long the rest of us have been here. So it's a very sort of empowering sort of tool that gives you, you know, ways of, of engaging, which I think people will enjoy as well as, as, well as um, yeah. extending. There's also this brilliant book that, yeah, and you know, <laughs> you could... <laughs> Share around. Words um. right out of my mouth. <laughs> well, the whole, point, the whole point of doing the book was to reach people uh, who had a kind of instinctive desire to vote yes but were a bit concerned, and, and we've heard this, but what do I say to people when they ask me why? 
because there's all, this, all these claims out there. How do I answer those claims? And we've also written it for those who feel um, uh, that they're not entirely sure which is the right way to vote, uh, but, but they actually care enough about it to want to try to understand it better. So it's actually designed to... And we don't, we don't pretend that we are presenting uh, both sides. We're not bothering to, to, um, to echo some of the more ridiculous claims that are being... and specious claims that are being made, but we are... we are committed to dealing in facts. And, it, yeah. and, it's, and it's written in a really... I mean, it's not a sort of boring handbook, check, check, check. It's actually the, the stories that Thomas and, and um, Kerry tell are actually extremely engaging. They really take you on a journey. Yeah, I mean, really, we do give the no people a, a voice through the frequently asked questions, right? We, we say, Briefly. you know... Briefly. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and we just smack it all down, you know, because it's rubbish. But, um, <laughs> but we, with facts. Can, can with I facts, yes. Um, Sorry, go on, go on. Oh, is there a question? Signs, Sorry. getting signs from the back. You want one last question, or we do the recital? I was just going to say we only we 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 wrote it in um, we started writing it in November. Yep. This November. November, and we had we were given a deadline by the publisher for December. <laughs> <laughs> we finished it in March after the first draft in February, and then um, all done in March. Mm. Um, we actually signed off on the final the final edit. Um, was um, was half an hour before the deadline, which was about an hour after uh, Cabinet had uh, mm. signed off on the final form of words. Mm. Yeah, we're quite lucky. Thing. So, so we managed to get that in. Um, and some of what has happened since, um, it, it might have been nice. Uh, we have, we've anticipated nearly everything that could have come at the, the yes side from no. And we've we've anticipated nearly all of the questions, but um, but it would have been nice to have kept dropping little <laughs> little. And and you're recording the audio book, I'm told as well. So if it's yeah, we're doing that soon. Audio okay, book. so last question, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. So and then people can um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I am a Bayuga woman from Northwest Grafton. And lots of um, my colleagues have been asking me, and I'm a mm. yes voter, but one of the things that people are often saying is, well, I saw Uncle blah, blah, or some mob saying that they're going to vote no because it's not strong enough. And I have my own um, strong feeling about what I think about that, but I'd love to hear what you think about that it's not going to do enough for um, people who have been waiting for so long. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so, put it this way, it's advisory to the parliament. That's one of the reasons why people are saying it's not strong enough, right? It's only advisory to the parliament. Um, of course, we'd love it to be more than advisory to parliament, but there's a reason why, you know, Barnaby Joyce came out almost, you know, 48 hours after the making of the Uluru Statement saying it's a third chamber to parliament and it'll have a right to veto because it was a fear-mongering tactic. It was um, with the knowledge that Australians just won't support something like that. Um, so nothing is going to... Um, in no way could we ever do better than that when it comes to the parliament, okay? Um, but then you need to think, is advisory powerless? No, it's not. You know, I'm a union member and a union official. We're only advisory to the Labor Party when they're in government, even though we created the Labor Party. That doesn't make us powerless as a collective of workers. What makes us strong is our ability to reach consensus amongst us, you know, to um, pool our resources, to move forward as a collective and, and have coherent... Um, positions. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's... Uh, I hope that sort of uh, response might help you. Yeah. Can I just add <coughs> that um, uh, another observation around that is that if you think that on the one side you've got, you've got the view of a Jacinta Price that, um, that mm. this voice is asking too much, it's going too far, it's going to lead to all these, you know, unintended consequences that we've been talking about. It's going to go too far. And then on the other hand, you've got the Lydia Thorpe view and the view of some of the people that you're referring to, which is that it doesn't go far enough. Now, often when, in a democracy, when you find that you've got one set of people here and another set of people there, uh, that, the, that the best position to arrive at, or the position that perhaps 
makes the most sense and is most representative of most people, including most indigenous people, which is true, is somewhere between those two poles. Um, that, uh, that is one, uh, to me, very obvious answer to that. And, uh, and the other is that, is that um, it, it is, there have been, you, you referred to polls, there have, I think there have been about five polls so far that have been done by reputable pollsters uh, that have sought to get the view of indigenous people about the voice being enshrined and in, 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 supporting the SVAC. And they haven't all been big samples, but, but even the major polls aren't on big samples, and some of those polls are very hard to conduct, as you could imagine, in regional and remote communities. But there has been a universality in the results. They've all gone between 80 to 88% of Indigenous Australians supporting the voice and supporting the enshrinement in the Constitution and, and recognition. Mm -hmm between 80 and 88% of Indigenous Australians. Just on the sample size, it, it's a gr the, the largest one certainly is a greater size, you know, greater proportion than any other polls, you know. We're talking, <coughs> it was almost 800 people, you know, when you're talking about 800 people out of 800,000, it's a bigger sample than you have in normal polls around which, the place. Which might, you know, some of those big polls that you, well, some of the some of the regular polls that you read might be on samples of 12 or 14 or 1,500 people can, around yeah, the whole nation. Yeah. Millions, can, yeah. I, can I just add to, your, to the observation that, that uh, Kerry and Thomas have brought to, to your question, and that is that I think that if there is a, a resounding yes, you know, that, that the moral authority that the voice will have will actually empower it in a way that goes beyond the sort of technical detail of it. Um, and, I mean, you can look for an example in terms of the, um, the same-sex marriage plebiscite. You know, that the moral authority that came with that decision actually made that an area which is not, you know, which is not contestable in a sense. Um, and that's why I think it's really important, you know, you know any yes will do, I think, from, from the point of view of the people on, on this stage. But, but a yes that is overwhelming is actually really powerful because it actually sends a message to the parliament, to the rest of the, the nation, to the world that this is really strongly held. And it opened up then the possibility of all sorts of things being up for change in a way that we've been too scared to do. Mm. You know, the, the other thing, and this is 30 seconds, the other thing that... 30 seconds. Did you know <laughs> this one? <laughs> <laughs> Time me. Time me. Time me. <laughs> the other thing uh, about this is that, is that for those people who feel it doesn't go far enough, I think you can, you can truthfully say, support the voice, get the voice up. That's not going to stop you making cases for other things that you feel right. might be stronger and right and righteous. Yeah. Yeah. Get the voice up and then keep going with your other stuff. Yeah. You can it's have harder. both. Yeah. Yeah. This does not mean if the voice gets up that you can't have that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. That was. That was, yeah, that well was done. <laughs> that was the briefest you've been. We've, we've gone over, over time, but I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to conclude by asking Thomas to recite the Uluru Seven. Okay. Yeah. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention. Coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands, and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual nation the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with their ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and it coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that a peoples possessed the land for 60 millennia 
and this sacred link should disappear from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967 we were counted. In 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I think I, okay. I, think I missed a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful, though. <laughs> Okay, line up. Line up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>